and you can be added to the music team. At this point, we're going to have our special feature. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. So, um, <laughs> Maria is very simple. Uh, we just want to talk about some of the things that Impact does, so that those who are joining us <clears throat> are able to know what what we do as Impact. So, there's um, there's a few programs that I'd like to tell you about. Uh, number one, at the moment, we're running um, a series where we go through the Bible from Genesis, hopefully to Revelations, through the year. So there's, um, it's called Walk Through the Bible. And then we share it usually on Facebook uh, and on our YouTube channel. So you can go to Impact Zambia, uh, Impact Mission on Facebook, and then um, Inspired Missionaries Proclaiming the Advent of Christ today on YouTube as well. So we started uh, with Genesis, somebody will go through maybe the fall of man, the fall of Lucifer, and then somebody will go through uh, the temptation and so go step, step by step or through the Bible. Then the second thing is that we usually have the Mission Empowerment Conference um, that comes every year, uh, uh, every after one year. So we would have, we were supposed to have one this year, but because of COVID-19, it had to be postponed. But then we we'll inform you on whether we'll have the next one. And then we have, annually we have missions. Um, some, some during the all through the year, but others at the end of the year. So for example, we have like in December, we have the big mission uh, where we go to different parts of the, of the country and entered areas. And for mission impact has sponsored, I think a number of missionaries we've done missions starting from Kenya, we've done missions in uh, Zimbabwe, we've done missions in South Africa, we've done missions in the Philippines. So different parts of the world, but then we have our local missions, especially in December. So for those who would be interested uh, or would like to go to any of these missions, the number will be in the chat box and then you can just chat room and then you can just get in touch. And for those who would like to join Impact as well, you can get in touch using the chat room. And then other than that, um, <clears throat> so we have events like this, but we also do some charity work. So would get donations of clothes and money and things like that to assist people in different communities. So for those that would like to do any of that, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you'll find the, the very number that's going to be posted. And if you can't get in touch through the number, you can find us always on Facebook, get in touch, write a message, and we'll definitely get back to you. And then apart from that, uh, we, we do sometimes, we do, we do have mission trainings. So for those who would like to undergo mission trainings and things like that, please feel free to get in touch uh, with us. And then I was also um, supposed to share with, with you that there are, there are a number of people who, who might be going through difficulties, a number of people who might be struggling uh, with opening up uh, with a lot of things and just needed somebody to speak to or needed professional assistance. So you can get in touch to the, with the very number that is going to be shared. We have a few impact members who are able to give professional support for free. So please feel free to get in touch with us there as well. And I hope we're all being blessed by this program. And uh, I hope we interact in many more different platforms. So please feel free, get in touch with us for anything. For, if you want to go on mission, if you want to donate, mm -hmm. if you would like to do anything else with impact, please feel free um, to get in touch with us and we'll be glad to assist. Thank you for joining in and I pray that you're blessed by this. Thank you. We are going to have a song before the teacher comes and present. He's coming back again, and I'm the only Pain and 
shame There calls my blessed Savior All the scars of mine The body of my Lord All the miles between the earth And God's blue heaven Could not keep him from Returning back to earth He's coming back again And I'm the only reason Like a groom will be Returning for his bride Reservations have been made I'll soon be going Have a mansion over on the other side Going to, I'm going to introduce the speaker for tonight. Um, our lesson is on sorry. Um, the speaker for tonight is Pastor Mohan. I am not too sure on how to pronounce his other name, so I will just call him Pastor Mohan. Um, our discussion is going to be on religious liberty and end events. I pray that we are all blessed by the message and that God blesses the speaker even as he speaks to us. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Somebody can respond. Can anyone hear me? Am I audible? Can somebody let me know if I'm if you're able to hear me or not? Can you hear? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, okay. Well, whoever that sister who said Pastor Mohan, I think you did a good job. That's good enough. Forget about my surname. That was good. Let us pray as we open God's word. Gracious Father, as we open your word, Open our hearts and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. If uh, by chance you don't hear me or something, just put a message on chat or my WhatsApp so that uh, I'll be alerted. Is that okay? Thank you. <clears throat> the topic for today is uh, a very important one. It is religious liberty and final events. I think every Christian, especially every Seventh-day Adventist, must understand where we are at this time of the prophetic line and also what is our impact 
and what is our role as we go through these last days. And one of the ways to get to know that is to understand the religious liberty, the freedom that we have or the right that we have. Many of us are so blind, we don't know what we believe, we do not know what our rights are, but it is high time that we get to know who we are, what our rights are, and uh, so that we can be able to make an impact in our own lives and in the lives of those whom we serve. So to begin with, what is religious liberty? The Adventist definition for re religious liberty is, it is uh, defined as the right of the individual to determine his or her own relationship to any religious tenant, principle or requirement, and the right to hold the, and practice their belief freely. It is more than the freedom to worship, maybe in a synagogue or a church or a mosque. It is not just worship in a place that we are seeking freedom. It means people shouldn't have to go against their core values and beliefs in order to conform to culture or government. It is more, religious freedom protects people's rights to live, to speak, and to act according to their beliefs peacefully and publicly. It protects their ability to be themselves at work, in class, and even at social activities. So the point is religious uh, liberty affects our life, not just at church, but at every aspect. We must understand that it affects at every aspect of our life that we live on this earth. Now, when it comes to religious liberty and the Adventist church, I want us to know that uh, uh, a religious liberty is rapidly becoming one of the most discussed subjects in Adventist church circles, not only at an international level, but also at the local congregations, people are getting to, uh, to be aware of what it is. Now, where does all this stem from? Where does religious liberty, all these principles come from? I want us to know that when God created human beings, uh, last time when I spoke, we spoke about the fall of Lucifer. Adam and Eve were created after the fall of Lucifer. God had had a big heartbreaking experience when the devil, Lucifer, turned into devil and rebelled in heaven. In spite of having that heartache and heartbreak and disappointment, when he decided to make man, he still chose to make man with freedom, complete freedom. Because the government of God is always associated with freedom of his creation. God never demands a forceful worship or allegiance to him. So when God created Adam and Eve, they were created with the freedom of choice and freedom of their will. So right in the beginning of the creation of man is the religious liberty principle that all of us have a right to exercise our beliefs, to practice what we want to and to worship the way we want to. So right in the garden of Eden, right in the creation, God has given us that freedom, and that's what the religious liberty is all about. Religious liberty concerns have been on the Seventh-day Adventist Church agenda ever since it was organized. Our leaders, if you remember the early history of the church, our leaders have to, uh, to, have to fight aggressively against restrictive Sunday laws in the late 19th century itself in the United States. There's a magazine which they actually produced those days called Liberty Magazine, which still exists, published by the Seventh Adventist Church uh, in, in the his, uh, has a history dating back to 1880s. 1880s. Currently, the church is vocal about religious liberties issues at the United Nations, the European Union, and other international and national bodies. We support the work of international religious liberty associations and Adventist experts serve as advisors to legislators dealing with laws covering church-state relationships. Now the question is why religious li liberty matters to us. Our understanding of scriptures leads us to believe that some of the issues that will face the end-time church 
will be matters of religious liberty, which will be backed up by laws intended to silence the voice of those who dare worship God in spirit and in truth. This and many other motivators make religious liberty concerns a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's agenda for today. Now, not only does the religious liberty is concerned about us as a church, religious liberty has an impact on others as well. You know, in most cases, Adventists are sometimes blamed to be intolerant with other Christians, with other uh, denominations or with other religions. We are so secluded. We have put ourselves in a box. We think of ourselves and everything outside of us is bad and evil. This is sometimes how the world labels us. Some, some, some groups even call us that we are a cult. But religious liberty gives us an opportunity to promote and protect not only our own religious freedom. However, we are, only, we are not only concerned with ourselves, we are, we are also recognized that we have a Christian duty to protect and fight for religious freedom for others. Our support of religious liberty for all demonstrates our true Christian character and can be an excellent way of removing prejudice against us. The church has sometimes been the victim of, as I said, religious intolerance and should identify with the rights of everyone to freely choose their own religious beliefs and to practice their convictions as they see, as they see fit. If you believe you have the right to do however you want and believe whatever you want to believe based on the scriptures, we must also have the same concept of others as to what they believe, how they believe. They may not believe the way we believe, but we, they have a right to believe. That's what the freedom is not just for us. It's a freedom for everybody. And we must respect that freedom if we were to respect our own freedom. Religi uh, religious liberty and local churches. I'm not sure how many of you in your own local churches uh, have a religious liberty department. And I'm sure most of the churches might be having. Um, but it must be one of the serious, important departments that should be active and uh, must be doing certain kind of education and other activities from time to time so that the church is kept abreast of what is happening around the world in terms of our religious liberty. Religious liberty is, uh, is seen at its best on the local level, the level of your own church and your immediate community. Why is it important? Because our members are exposed to religious prejudice on a daily basis due to largely to the non-conformist nature of our beliefs and practices. Ours is a task to fight against and to seek and to remove prejudice, especially with those about our own church and our doctrines and our practices and our activities have been attacked. So we should have this education so that we are clear in who we are and what we do and we can tell others. At the same time, we must also have to fight against prejudice which may be harbored about others. So any kind of restriction or prejudice can hinder the spread of the gospel that needs to be challenged. Therefore, our local churches must be um, uh, kept uh, informed, updated about the religious liberty that we all have. Religious liberty has never come easily. The history reveals much blood has been shed by people for the freedom that we exercise today for the worship and the beliefs that we have. So we must not take it lightly. We are going to come, there's going to come a time when we, have, we will be tested of the conscious and the liberty that we have. So, that, uh, we, so we need to be uh, highly informative and educative and, uh, in, our, uh, in how we know and what we believe in our religious liberties. But the question is, why religious liberty? In our Adventist uh, church, we have specific reasons why we support religious freedom. Let me give you seven of them. Number one, Bible itself promotes religious liberty. As I said in the beginning, God is a God of freedom and does not use force. He invites choice, offers salvation, and does not use force. He desires a free response. So whosoever has the son, it says, he is free indeed. So, the Bible itself promotes religious liberty. The second point is to maintain human dignity. There is a dehumanizing effect when man's religious liberty is removed 
religious liberty is based on the dignity of the human person and is an unalienable right it's a human so when you uphold religious liberty you are upholding human dignity with which we have been created uh then the third one for self protection seventh day adventists are a minority group and in particular have experienced religious restrictions regarding the sabbath so when religious liberty is denied we have much to lose i'm sure in some of our countries where you come from we have issues with sabbath so if we are not serious about our religious liberty then we are denied of our privileges but have but knowing our religious liberty and the freedom we have it is much easier to defend our sabbath and make our voice known and the fourth one the prophetic understanding we as a church believe in the prophecies and how quickly and how accurately they have been fulfilling so what what does it mean knowing what the future holds and knowing that the issues of the great controversy is centered on the true and false worship it is vital that religious liberty be highlighted to the people because that will be a test in the last days the fifth point to remove prejudice we want to reveal ourselves as we are and demonstrate the kind of god we worship to the world religious liberty is essential in proclaiming the right god with the right gospel and the sixth point to combat religious intolerance the denial of religious freedom is a frequent cause of conflicts and violence it provokes deep seated grievances and promotes instability in society by combating religious intolerance we demonstrate that our god is not intolerant that his invitation for salvation is universal so when we understand uh, the religious liberty in its context and in its entirety we exercise patience with others who don't agree with us and that way we can show to the world how god is patient with sinners and the final point religious liberty is important because it promotes god's values and ideals by supporting religious liberty we demonstrate god's values and ideas in practice if you it is a highly effective witness for the truth of the gospel and as we do so as the uh, first corinthians chapter 4 verse 9 says a spectacle to the world to angels and to men when we uplift the word of god highly and when we speak of it and when we defend the truth and uh, with the freedom that we have we become a spectacle to the world and and uh, to the angels and to our fellow men so such ideas mean that we have to broaden religious liberty beyond a narrow view of protecting our own beliefs and practices we cannot accept the view that religious liberty is only for those who have the truth liberty implies the freedom to be wrong also that's what liberty is all about you have a choice to be right or you have a choice to be wrong praise god the truth puts us on the right path so our primary reason for promoting religious liberty is that it is inherently true and right so that people who are on the wrong path can could see what the religious freedom could offer to them and as i said the the religious liberty has a, a global scope not just a local level you know religious liberty knows no boundaries it is not restricted to a region or a religion since it is based on a fundamental god given right the freedom will it is not for a nation or a government to grant or to remove every government has its own laws restrictions but when it comes to religious liberty it is universal because it is god given but sadly however many nations attempt to limit the freedom of religion and its free exercise as a result when when the religious freedom is limited what happens millions around the world live in conditions that violate freedom of belief and of conscience to greater or lesser degree the church has a great mission in this area if there is no religious freedom at all as in the case of a few countries like the middle east and some of the communist countries then even the possibility of spreading the gospel is denied so in addition the church has a duty to support and defend those who whose religious freedoms are violated in other words because of the religious liberty we have in the church those those brothers and sisters of ours in the countries where they have no freedom 
who are being persecuted and they have nobody to defend their rights from the global point of view from the higher levels of government or in the systems in the churches we can raise our voice to fight or to defend our brethren who have no religious liberty in their own countries or in their own towns and cities so it is important that it doesn't it's not only affect will it affect us but it's affect uh, when we when we exercise religious liberty and promote it it helps us to defend our brothers and sisters who are denied of that kind of a system so such reasons explain the global scope of the church in religious liberty and the need for greater involvement the more we involve in the affairs of the world not at the political level per se but making our voice known at every level people will be able to know what we believe why we believe and why we defend in what we believe like daniel and shadrach and meshach nego when they were in the government now they stood as a stalwarts of what they believed people saw them and could understand why they believe and what they believe and esther was there to defend her people so we also must need to defend our rights in all uh, places now the question is how is religious uh, how is religious liberty promoted by seventh day adventist church it is done by two ways one is through international associations what do i mean by that there are two international associations of world leaders and people who hold these principles of uh, religious liberty the first one is the international religious liberty association what we call irla then the headquarters is in washington dc and uh, the local headquarters will be in the division that wherever you are from and the second is called the international association for the defense of religious liberty that is iadrl with its headquarters actually in bern in switzerland both these organizations promote protection of religious freedom through facilitating world congress and through contacts with international organizations and human right entities as well as contact with national governments so we have this uh international associations which always keep abreast to the church on the updates of how the systems are being run at the government level at the local level and if there is a way that affects our religious freedom they always highlight and make sure that uh, our representation is made clear the second way that our, uh, our religious liberty is promoted in adventist church is through a, a magazine i'm not sure how many churches receive you can all subscribe to this Uh, it's called liberty magazine it actually uh, it promotes both the associations through publications of journal seventh adventists were involved in this publishing initially it started as as american sentinel in 1886 but later it was developed into liberty magazine liberty is published bi monthly and is published uh, um, um, in europe since 1948 in several languages i'm sure it is published in other places as well so what 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 does this magazine do this magazine is a compendium of religious liberty issues and activities it presents well researched materials written by experts in religious issues representing various world views readers and subscribers of uh, subscribers of religious liberty include all all types of people statesmen lawyers scientists religious leaders journalists educators human rights act advocates public opinion makers so this is a good place or a good magazine where all of us can be able to have access maybe your local church can order so that all of us can be updated on what is happening around the world in terms of our religious freedom that's how the church keeps its members updated on the religious uh, liberty issues uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the basic point or uh, the bottom line point is there are two aspects of religious liberty if you can get this i think you understood it clearly the first one is it's a freedom to believe and hold religious opinions and the second is freedom to act in accordance with one's beliefs that means not only you have a freedom to believe what you believe you must have the freedom to act in what you believe these two are the basic ingredients of our religious liberty that we speak about but have you realized i was i just gave you a little bit of history 
and a little bit of understanding of what religious liberty means. But the topic today is religious liberty and final events. That means how does religious liberty affect in the last days? Now, before we go into the last days, I want us to know that we are already in, in situations where religious liberty has been threatened in so many ways. Uh, and since the audience right now are from different countries, I can only speak for myself here in the UK and uh, know a little bit about what's happening in US. But I'm sure you, with all the knowledge you have and with the internet around, you could uh, Google and see how, what kind of threat the Christians are facing in terms of our religious liberty. Loss of Christian freedom in Middle East and in other communist countries is common. We all know that it is happening. We all know that one. But the interesting and most scaring part is this. In the, in the, in the countries that are called Christian countries, like United Kingdom, where I am from, and United States and some other Western European countries, which were based and built on Christian principles, are losing their religious freedom. It is there in the law, but by practice, I am here for the last 17 years, so I know what I'm speaking about. By practice, we are almost losing our freedom to express ourselves, even as Christians, being in a Christian nation. Equally, have, uh, as uh, examples, let me quote a few examples, just give you an idea how the religious freedom is being slowly snatched away and, it, uh, and how it can affect us if we are not serious about it. And um, I had a member, church member, a few years ago who, who was a, uh, a teacher. And one day, one of her pupils asked her at school, teacher, do you believe in uh, gay marriages, LGBT? One of her students asked her, and she said, well, I don't believe that is the right way to live. But if that's what you believe, that's your choice. But personally, I don't believe. Is there anything wrong in saying that? The student went and complained to the head of the, teacher, head of the school that this is what the teacher believes. So the teacher was called and said, did you say this? The teacher said, yeah. The student asked me if I believe in LGBT, and I said, no. I don't believe that is the right way of life. But if they believe, I have no objections. But personally, I don't believe. And uh, to cut the story short, the school board felt that she is not fit to teach because she is not adhering to the laws of the school or the, law, the laws of the country. And you believe it or not, she lost her job. We try to represent, do whatever we could, but no. She is not fit to teach. She is not fit to teach students because she doesn't believe in LGBT. So you can see how the freedom, religious freedom, the religious liberty to believe what you want to believe, to express what you want to express, is being lost. This is happening in a country which boasts itself of having seventy percent Christian, built on Christian principles. Have you heard of, uh, and, uh, uh, we, right here again in England, in Cornwall in England, this happened in 2008, a Christian couple owns a hotel. So a gay couple goes to there and asks for a room. And when they realize that they were a gay couple, the Christian uh, owners of this hotel said, sorry, we can't rent, give you a room because we don't believe in this kind of a marriage. And you know what happened? They were sued in the court and they lost the battle. They have to pay the fine of 3,600 pounds just because they refused to give a room. They said, we don't, we don't believe in that kind of lifestyle. We are not saying anything against you. You go, there's so many other hotels, you can go. But as Christians, we don't believe in such kind of a relationship, gay, two men on the same bed. So our conscience doesn't allow us to rent a room, so sorry. Kindly, politely, they were told. But then they went and sued this. And then the government came heavy on them and they were fined. And then not only they were fined, you know, their, their hotel name was removed from the advertisement post that they put in the local areas. And people from then on could not go. They have to uh, stop their business and turn it into a non-profit organization. 
and do some charity work just because they believed in the principle. Where is the religious freedom? Where is the religious freedom? And the judgment, you know what they said in the judgment? This came in uh, uh, 2011. You know, you can Google it, you will find it. You know, the, the P Peter and Hazel Mary Bull, these are the owners of the hotel. Now, the judgment came, which said, regardless of each people's, uh, each person's religious beliefs, no one is above the law. You can keep your beliefs, but I want you to know that your beliefs are not above our laws. We read in the Bible, Peter have to once again said, it is better to obey God than man. And I'm telling you, this is happening in a Christian nation. And she has, they had there, but they stood. We thank God for people like them who stood to what they believe. They were not interested in money. They lost money. You know, in the last days, uh, Revelation 13 says, in the last days, when the mark of the beast is uh, uh, put on us, you know, what was one of the effects? You will neither buy nor be able to sell. It simply doesn't mean that you have to sell or buy. You, you lose financially. Look at these people losing 3,600 pounds just because they refused. So this is, this is going to affect what you want to do. And there's another story right here in UK, in Belfast. You can, you can read these stories on online later when you have time. Um, this is in Belfast. Uh, gay, uh, gay people go to, they have a bakery. A couple have a Christian people, they have a bakery. And gay people go to them and say, look, we want, to, we, want to, um, we want you to bake a cake and write the name, support gay marriage. They went to a Christian man who owns a bakery and uh, they said, we want you to bake a cake and put, write, put the writing what? Support gay marriage. Now, this is where religious liberty and freedom of speech or your conscience, you have to live according to your conscience. Some of us compromise so easily because we don't want to take risks. We don't want to, we don't want to be seen as different or we don't want to fall into trouble or get into debts or get into problem with police. How many times we compromise truth just to escape things like this. But this bakery owner, they said, sorry, we can't do it. We are not against your lifestyle. That is up to you how you live. But we have our own principle. We can't write. And, and uh, again, they went to the court. Thankfully, this time, uh, they won the case. The Christian bakery people, they won the case. They won the case. The Supreme Court had ruled. Uh, why? The unanimous decision by the UK's highest court was greeted as a victory for free speech, but condemned by gay rights groups and the Equality Commission of Northern Ireland as a backward step in combating discrimination. All other groups condemned, but thankfully, the Supreme Court uh, uh, said, you know what? They have not discriminated you. They were just, uh, I, I mean, but this freedom, at least they won it, but I don't know how long it will last. So um, have you heard of so many other stories, even simple things like wearing a cross? Of course, as Adventists, we don't believe in wearing a cross, but so many Christians do that. When a British Airways, one of the, one of the uh, workers in British Airways, uh, she wore a cross. And they said, no, you can't wear it in public. But thankfully, she filed a case and she won. But there are others like Lillian Ledilly, Shirley Chaplin, Mary uh, Gary McFallon. Uh, the, one is a nurse, one is a registrar, the other is a Bristol marriage counselor. They all were crosses when they go for work and they were denied and their claims were dismissed. If you want to continue to work, you cannot come with a cross on you. You don't even have a freedom. You're not saying anything to anyone, but yet you can't express yourself. This is happening. This happened in January 2013. Have you heard of Ten Commandments? This news has been all over the places. Before a city council building, it is in United States, New Mexico City. The Supreme Court ordered, there was, you know, uh, in the lawn of the town hall, uh, town uh, outside the city hall lawn, there was this... Uh, 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 um, ten Commandment Monument. Now, people who saw it, who are the atheists or whoever, who doesn't know, they can and complain. How, how come in a public uh, lawn or uh, a public town hall, you keep these Ten Commandments? So the government ordered that they be removed. 
America also was established based on the principles of God. Even in the, on their money, they write, in God we trust. And everybody, they speak, God bless you. But look at the practices. If we believe in prophecies with the Catholicism, the mark of the beast, the image to the beast, the USA, they are going to bring out serious things that will affect our religious liberty. So the Ten Commandments monument was completely removed. And there was a Ten Commandment poster in a Kentucky courthouse. And then somebody complained that it is unconstitutional to have Ten Commandments poster in a courthouse. So that had to be removed, and it was removed. And there was a Ten Commandment, uh, Ten Commandments written in a courtroom in July 2018. Somebody complained, and that display of the Ten Commandments at the Alabama Judicial Building at, uh, in Montego Mary was completely removed. This is not happening in Islamic countries or communist countries. This is happening where we think Christianity is all in all. Schools, this is right here in England. You know, this is a, this is a Christian school. Uh, a parents who don't believe in Christianity, they're atheists, they send their children to the Christian school knowing that faith schools do teach about Bible and they'll have assemblies where they sing songs and pray. But because of the freedom they have, they can opt out. What happens here in England is if you don't want your, if you want your child to attend in a Christian school, they have to abide by the rules. But if you don't want them to attend uh, worship services or sing, you, you put in your application that we don't want our children to have any religious education. So what the schools does is they, they, they will, um, during the assembly, they will put them separate in a room or somewhere where they can be on their own so that they don't have to participate. That's what this school did. But the children go home and they say, you know, we heard these songs and we saw the Bible and all. And the parents sued the school, saying that my children are being indoctrinated in the school. Why do you send your children to a Christian school and still complain that the school is indoctrinating? And do you believe it or not, the government heard their voice. The school actually said, we actually put the children away. And another complaint they told is when they have a year-end ceremony, you know, in every school they have an year-end ceremony. Because it's a faith school, they all go to the church building and that's where they have the ceremony. And the complaint was, why do you have this uh, year-end services in a church? You're indoctrinating our children. I'm, I'm trying to let you know how freedom is slowly being taken away from us. It is so subtle that you can't even imagine that you are being affected. Some of us are in deep sleep, not realizing how serious it could be someday to you and to me. So that's what is, uh, that happened. And well, so Bibles, Bibles are being refused, distributing, in, in, I'm sure you all know Gideons. Praise God for Gideons who give free Bibles everywhere. They put them in the hotel rooms, they put them in the prison, they put them in schools, they put them in every place that they have a permission. It was such a common thing to do in uh, United States, every year at the beginning of the school, they would go to the school and pray and give Bible to whoever wanted. But now system has changed. They should not distribute Bibles in schools. And people who received, they went and complained as a result, no Bibles in schools. And you know something? Children, you're, you're not supposed to give Bibles when they're young. But you know where Bibles can be given freely and nobody has objection? It is in jails. It is in prisons. Gideons can go to prisons and give Bibles freely even now. Nobody will object. But my point is, if you, have, if you would have given Bible to them and they are young, they will not be in jail in the first place. When they needed the Bible the most, you deny them. And when they get into some trouble and go to jail, that's when you think you need God. Look at the way we are doing things. Look at the way lifestyle has changed. So that's what is happening there. Uh, now, um, another, another person, I'm not sure if you had, this is again a very interesting thing. The, in the, this happened in the United States, Kentucky, in the county where the law was brought that they, uh, about the gay marriages. It is now legal for same-sex marriages to take place. And the lady who is a registrar, a deputy registrar in that place is a Christian. In other words, people can come get married 
um, so that they, and they have to give in a certificate. This lady who is a Christian, her name is Kim Davis. This happened in 2015, Kim Davis. She refused to give the certificate because she believes marriage is between male and female, not between Adam and Sam. So she would say, sorry, I can't issue because it is against my conscience to write two male names on a marriage certificate. She refused to give. And the complaint was made on her. And you know what? They put her in jail because she's going against the laws of the land. For six days, she was imprisoned. And later, she was brought out. And uh, what happened? She was told, well, if you don't want to um, write a certificate, that's fine with you, but let others do it. You don't have to interfere with that. But that that's fine. I'm not against people, how, what they practice, how they live. But my conscience doesn't allow me to do something that I don't believe in what my Bible taught me. Some of you may not be affected in this sense right now, but a day is coming where each of our faith will be tested. If you're not faithful in the little things that we do, tell a little lie here, compromise a bit there. When these things attack us, we will give in easily. People are experiencing persecution just because of what they believe. And this is happening right now. Religious liberty is being snatched away from us very subtly and we are not even aware of this. Even here in England, now rules are coming where you should have children. In the children, even in primary school, even in primary school, nowadays they're saying uniform. You know, uniform system started actually from Britain. All over the world, we wear tie, we wear suit. We wear... But you know what they're saying now? Actually, from this September, they're planning to implement they can, I'm not sure if the law has been passed or not, but last year there was a discussion where it says children should have the freedom to wear unisex uniforms. In other words, if a boy wants to wear a skirt, he should be given the freedom to wear a skirt. If the girl wants to wear a trouser, she should have the freedom. They must be given the freedom to express themselves. None of us, because if you remember in the Western world, I know, I do not know the other parts of the world, even children as little as six, seven, eight, they are now confused of their sexuality, their identity. They are even questioning, why am I a boy? I don't want to be a boy. I want to be a girl. I don't think I, 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 I'm meant to be a boy. I, I'm meant to be a girl. And they have a right to choose their own sex at the age of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. When their minds are so tender, they don't know what is happening. The schools promote that. Not only that, even toilets, unisex toilets now. You can't say it's a male toilet, it's a female toilet. Unisex. Anybody can go to any toilet. You should not discriminate. If there's a gay, if there's a lesbian, if there's somebody else with another gender, they should not be discriminated. So the toilets must not be called as male or female. They must be called unisex where everybody can. If a mother goes to school with her children, if she has a boy and a girl, she should not be taking them to do different things. She can take them to one toilet if she has to. Where are we heading to? What is happening to our convictions of what we believe to be true? And this is happening right in countries where Christian principles are the ones that the countries were built upon. And it is going to spread everywhere. Everywhere it is going to spread. Religious liberty and final events. What we have seen so far are the threats of religious freedom is nothing in comparison to what is yet to come. My dear believers, let's not continue to sleep. Just because it didn't affect you so far doesn't mean it will not affect you. Each one of us will have to make a call and stand for what we believe. The, the, the worst is yet to come. There are two institutions, get me, get this, there are two institutions that God established in the Garden of Eden, even before sin entered. You know what they were and what they are? It is Sabbath, observance of seventh day Sabbath. And the second is the sacredness of marriage. Do you know what the devil did? These two institutions that God himself established before sin could enter, the devil has been so successful 
in destroying them. Both of them. Someone said the most endangered species on species on this earth right now is not a lion or a tiger or some kind of a rare animal. It is a family unity. Families are disintegrating at a very large pace. There are more children living in single homes than in both parents' homes. I'm talking about a Western culture. I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the world, but this is affecting. People no longer believe in marriages. They can live together and have children. Marriage, getting into a contract is, is a nightmare. If I like it, I will stay in it. If I don't like it, I will walk away. Even before sin could come, even before Sabbath, marriage institution took place. Through this marriage institution, God wants us to see the unity of love. We believe in a trinity. How can three people be one? How can they think the same? How can they do the same? How can they love each other without any? God in his unit trinity has given a family for us to experience that, that uh, unity. But the devil has been successful in destroying. In the Western world right now, we are the marriage, the divorce are taking more in number than the marriages that take place. There's more divorces than marriages. What about Sabbath? Look at how it has affected. So many people do not know what Sabbath is. And you remember when Trump was running for presidency and then at one point of time, uh, what is our Adventist guy, what's his name? Ben Carson, he was, uh, I think at the first round or so, he was at the top and suddenly realized there was a black man who was running for a presidency and that he's a Christian and he comes from a Seventh-day Adventist church. If you, ha if you have heard uh, his speech, Trump's speech, well, who are Seventh-day Adventists? I've never heard of them. I'm not sure if he said it sarcastically or not, as, as in many cases he said, it, but he's saying, I've never heard that there is a church called Seventh-day Adventists. Look at how far the devil has taken. Anywhere you go, which is the day of worship? Sunday. And if you say you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you worship on Saturday. What is Saturday? You worship on Saturday? What is that? Why do you do it? Why do you go against the whole, what the whole world is doing? Look at how successful the devil has been in desecrating these two holy institutions that were there even before sin entered. And they become, both the institutions were under severe attack, as I said. It appears that Satan has been successful in destroying, but praise be to God, he will not be successful. And in the last days, liberty of conscience will be threatened in the last days. I want you to maybe today or tomorrow, there's a book, uh, the book Great Controversy, there's a chapter called uh, Liberty of Conscience Threatened. So please read it. I will just share a few thoughts from that chapter. This is a chapter in God, Great Controversy entitled Liberty of Conscience Threatened where Ellen White explains how the papacy has threatened the religious freedom in the past and how it will affect us in the last days. You know, Revelation 12, 17 says, and the dragon was wrought with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The dragon is actually uh, wrought with the woman. Woman is a church, whether it is Adventist church or whatever, Christians, the devil is angry with Christians, whoever they may be in, in general terms. But more so, the by verse says what? And went to make war with whom? The remnant of her feet. I mean, those people that are particularly called, around, who are they? The same text says, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So though the, the devil is angry with the church, angry with Christians in general, he is particularly concerned with one type of people who are chosen, who are a remnant, and the, and, the, and the identity of those remnant people are that they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm proud to say I belong to the remnant group. And I'm, I'm proud that you also belong to the remnant group. But just to pat myself on my shoulders that I belong to this church is not good enough. Because the devil, what did he do? He, he comes to make war with us. Not a literal war with a sword and a spear, but in the conscience to snatch away the freedom that you have. 
like how we believe the mark of the beast will be put on your right hand, which is a symbol of you cooperate with everything that is having, or on your forehead, or as in your mind you have made it to compromise to the to the to the laws and principles that govern around you. We are being affected by them at our workplace, at our homes, in our churches, in our public places, day in and day out. And some of us are not even serious. Well, I'm a human. This is my weakness. God understands me. This is my personality. I can't help it. Lord, have mercy on me. How, how subtly we compromise and do these things. But it is, going, it is affecting. Due to lack, lack of time, I, uh, uh, sorry, Ellen White says, there are two great deceptions that take this world by surprise in the last days. You know what are those two great deceptions? Sunday sacredness and immortality of the soul. Sunday sacredness and immortality of the soul. These two things will sweep the world and look at immortality of the soul. Great preachers like Billy Graham, D.L. Moody, name some towering pre uh, preachers. And when you hear them preach on funerals, when you hear them preach on the state of the dead, all that you hear is, they are in heaven now with God. How much the immortality of the soul has swept the Christian world. Even among Adventists, when somebody die and when we bury them, automatically we say, rest in peace. You know, rest in peace now is not biblical. We have been affected by this unconsciously in so many ways. And we are not serious about it. And the Sabbath, of course, we are compromising even as Adventists the amount of the certain things that we do on Sabbath. We think that Sabbath is going to church for those three hours and worship and come back and the rest of the time is yours. Sabbath is 24-hour time, a holy time, a holy time. These two will be deceiving in the last days. To understand what will happen in the last days, we should know what happened in the past. What happened? So, as I said, two, two, de two deceptions in the last days, Sunday observance or Sunday sacredness and, this, and the immortality of the soul. But uh, just one of the things that concerns us more now is the Sunday sacredness or Sunday observance. We all know how it began with the Roman Emperor Constantine becoming a Christian in 312 AD. The way was paved for the Catholic supremacy an introduction of Sunday sacredness. In 321 AD, Sunday observance was enacted by Constantine. Sunday was actually a pagan festival, but this was employed because now a pagan emperor became a Christian and then he brought it into existence. This edict required, you know, how did it, be, how did it yeah, actually begin is this. Towns, uh, it, the edict required towns people to rest. Only people who live in the towns, they should rest. But those in the villages, those who work in the farms, they can work on Sunday. That's how slowly the Sunday, uh, Sunday sacredness started. Now, later, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a bishop called Eusebius. He, was a he, he had the royal mandate not provoking a sufficient substitute for divine authority. He couldn't find any divine authority for the change of Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. But he was a bishop, and uh, he, he said, Christ has trans transferred the Sabbath to Sunday. He actually sought favor of the princess, and uh, he was a special friend to Constantine. So he said, Christ has actually transferred the Sabbath to from Saturday to Sunday. But he could not show a single text from both the Old or New Testament to defend his. And he says all things, he says not only all things, whatever was done as a duty on the Sabbath, Saturday, now must be done on a Sunday. But the Sunday argument has no grounds with the scriptures. And to prove the change, they, uh, and they started slowly introducing some kind of laws. Even the religious leaders who would judge people, like the elders and all, they said no judgment should take place on a Sunday. As I said, you will find all this in the book Great Controversy under the chapter 
religious uh, liberty threatened. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, liberty of conscience threatened. Now people are not willing to believe much. So they, they try to introduce some miracles to let people see that it is true. So what are the stories they cooked up with this? They said miracles were also called into requisition. Among these wonders was, it was reported that there once there was a farmer who wanted to plow his land on a Sunday. So he went and took his tools, his plow, and he was trying to clean it with an iron. And as he was cleaning with, with some iron, it poked into his hand. It, and you know, it says the iron stuck fast in his hand and it was there almost for two years. He was walking around, people could see and say, well, how did it get into you? You know, I was trying to work on a holy day and this is the punishment that I got. This is the punishment I got. So people now, you can see how subtly the devil was trying to inflict fear in people, lose their religious freedom, lose their religious consciousness to, to believe what the Bible says and to accept what they teach. So people started, so later when Pope heard these stories, he gave direction to the parish priest should admonish the violators of Sunday and wish them, they have, all people have to go to Sunday and offer prayer. Then afterward, maybe they can go for work. Otherwise, why? They have to go, otherwise they bring great calamity on themselves, like how this man got poked by this iron. Not only they bring calamity on themselves, but they bring calamity on their neighbors because they they are not worshiping on Sunday. And ministers and bish, uh, bishop, uh, bishops and priests started telling everybody it is important that you worship God on Sunday. And that's what happened. Later, another story, another miracle people told was somebody was struck by lightning because he was working on Sunday. So they said, look, Sunday must be must have been a Sabbath. Otherwise, why would God punish somebody by striking them with a lightning? So by cooking up these stories of miracles, which people did not see maybe personally, or things that might have happened, they started building, inflicting pain in people's lives, fear in people's lives, and pull them to the uh, uh, worship of Sunday. Out and so many things, other things happened. There was and uh, in the twelfth century. In the 12th century, one of the persons came to England. The name was not given in the book, but it says he was a zealous advocate of Sunday. He thought he would bring it to England and promote it here. He came with this news that Sabbath, the holy day is Sunday because Jesus was on that day and it's the Lord's day and whatever. What? But because people did not find any evidence in the scriptures, they could not accept it. So he felt defeated. He went back. And then after some time, he returned with some kind of a proof some kind of an authority to let people know that it is Sunday, that is a holy day. What did he come up with? What did he come up with? It says he brought up with him a, a roll, purporting to be from God, some kind of a scroll, which he said, this is from God. This is from where? This is from God himself, which contained the needed commandments for Sunday observance. And those who do not observe Sunday there are so many laws in this that threatens their life for their disobedience. Look at how they inflict fear and pain. And then he says, this precious document as a base counterfeit of the institution it supported was said to have, how did it come? He said that it was fallen from heaven and to have been found in Jerusalem upon the altar of Saint Simeon in Golgotha. The scroll fell from heaven and Jerusalem at the temple at Golgotha near St. Uh, Simeon's place, I believe. And then what does it say? You must keep the Sunday and those who do not keep, they will experience hardships and pain and threats of disobedience will be there. So what did the pontifical, actually, this was actually made up in of our Rome, but then they projected it as though it came from Jerusalem, as though it fell from heaven. This is in a great controversy page. 576. There, uh, Ellen White also quotes the, some of the historical sources. So please read that chapter. It will highlight you more. So it was reported that, um, so what does, what does this contain? You know what this contains? According to him, it says people should not work from a ninth hour, that is three o'clock on Saturday afternoon up to 
sunrise on monday morning those are the holy hours you should not work and this is and and how does how does uh, this confirm it says many miracles took place to confirm those were the holy hours and what are some of the miracles it says that those who reported working laboring beyond the appointed time they were stricken with paralysis that's the stories they brought up and next it says there was a miller who attended to grind his corn you know those days they have to grind the corn which they grew this man tried to do it on a sunday because that was a holiday according to what this they were propagandizing so when he tried to do it what the it says the he saw instead of flour a torrent of blood coming out and the mill wheel got stuck not withstanding the strong rush of water can you imagine he was trying to grind instead of the flour coming out he saw the blood coming out and see look you broke the sabbath you broke the holy the sunday sacredness and god punishing you another story they came up with a woman who placed dough in the oven found it raw when taken out though the oven was very hot can you imagine and another woman it says dough reported to be baking at the ninth hour but determined to set it aside till monday in other words when she wanted to bake a bread maybe and she wanted to put in the oven but she realized by then the sabbath began that is saturday afternoon after after 3 o'clock it is saturday according to what they try to propagate so she decided not to put it because she doesn't want to bake it on saturday and when monday morning came and she saw the dough you know what the story says the dough was the next day it has been made into loaves and baked by divine power because she kept the holy day another story says um uh, a man who baked the bread after the ninth hour on saturday found when he broke it in the next morning blood came out of the bread by this such absurd and superstitious fabrication did the advocates of sunday endeavor to establish its sacredness this is historically recorded you can find the evidence in ellen white's book in page 526 to 530 of great controversy this is how the promotion of the sunday laws began to affect people they try to inflict fear into people by the superstitious miracles that they said propagated happened because people broke the sabbath how will it affect in the last days how will your freedom snatched away from you bible clearly tells that in the last days satan the devil like an angel of light he will perform miracles he will perform miracles he is powerful god has not taken all his powers yet he is still powerful i'm so surprised nowadays the biggest largest churches where people want to flock is this charismatic churches where the preaching is on the prosperity gospel just come to christ all your troubles will over there is no problem if you have financial problems you will you will be relieved if you have a sickness you will be healed people are so much lulled into this kind of messages they they they, they seem to be so soothing to their ears to their heart no matter what kind of a sinner you are just come to christ he'll wash away god has all the power this is half truth this is half truth you go tell people the judgment is coming god is coming you need to change your ways you need to live a clean life they look at you like you're a fanatic the devil is prospering in 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 denying our religious freedom and affecting our conscience that we are not even aware of so how this religious uh, this will happen as i said what so what has happened so far is nothing in comparison to what we are going to experience the sunday loss will come the mark of the beast the papacy will again gain power and with the help of the image to the beast which we believe is the united states things will get worse as i said already i'm seeing we are losing this religious freedom i cannot express myself here in uk i cannot go freely and preach i need to take permission for a, 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 being a christian country at in, you know uh, let me give you this example one of the church i was pastoring we we, we needed parking spaces so we went to the local government to say look we at least 
in front of our churches. Give us some space on Saturdays so that sometime whereby our members can come and uh, park. The council denied. Just next to our street, there was a Muslim mosque. The Friday, they have freedom to park. They, have, they, have, they were given the permission to park on Fridays because their prayers are on Fridays, but we are not given on a Saturday. We asked them, how come you treat them different to us? Well, the, the neighbors doesn't want to. Even in a Christian country, I don't have the freedom to even apply for some permission to do something that I feel is right. We are losing our freedom slowly. And if we are not awakening, standing up to what we believe, it may be too late for us that way. So uh, these things are happening. There are many in the last days. Sunday enforcement will come soon. And then if we don't believe to what we do, it's going to affect us. So what shall we do then? Should we sit idle and say, let it happen? Well, this all should happen. Bible prophesies it should happen. None of us can stop it. So let it happen in its own time, in its own way. Is that how you, your, uh, your reaction to it is? Those who wait on God idly and do nothing, I'm telling you, that is not going to be a good thing to be a Christian. God, we have to do something. So should we sit idle and say nothing? Is, this is the time for us to use our religious freedom to defend the rights that we have. If we sit quietly, how will the world know what we are believing in? When you don't proclaim it, when you don't express it, it is almost like denying it. We have been looking for many years for a Sunday law to be launched. This is what Alan White says in our land, talking about America. And now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, will our people do their duty in the matter? Can we not assist in lifting the standard and in calling to the front those who have regard for their religious rights and privileges? The time is fast approaching when those who choose to obey God rather than man will be made to feel the hand of oppression. Shall we then dishonor God by keeping silent while his holy commandments are trodden underfoot? While the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to Rome, let us arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us in these true bearings. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let us show people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awakening the world into a sense of the value of the privilege of religious liberty so long enjoyed. Testimonies, volume 5, page 716. How can we do it? The question is, how should we do it? Should we, should we fight with the governments that deprive us of our religious freedom and liberty? Should we go to the courts to file a case and fight? Should we have to approach the human rights organization and other organizations and complain that our rights have been taken away from us? Is that how we defend our rights? Ellen White also gives the best method to defend our freedom. This is in, uh, in the letter 58 of 1906, Councils to Writers and Editors. That's where she wrote this. She says, we should now be doing our very best to defeat this Sunday law. We should not wait for the Sunday law to come and then fight for it. That's not the way to fight. Prevention is better than cure. We may not prevent it, but if we lift up on what we believe, no, anyway, let me complete what she says. We should not be doing our way, sorry, we should now be doing our very best to defeat this Sunday law. The best way to do this will be to lift up the law of God and make it stand forth in all its sacredness. The best way to defeat Sunday law is to lift up the law of God and hold it in its full entirety and its sacredness. As I said in one of my remarks, as Christians, especially Seventh-day Adventists, are we uplifting God in our personal life, the law of God in our personal life and in, and in the things that we do? How many of you can faithfully, boldly say that you keep the Sabbath holy? How many of us gossip? How many of us do worldly things? How many of us get into internet and do all sorts of things? after the church is over. What kind of light are we shedding to the rest of the world? How can somebody say that we are truly people who uphold this torch of the truth so that the darkness can see it clearly? 
So what is the best method to defend our religious freedom is to uplift the law in how we do it. The other ends of truth are now called upon to choose between disregarding a plain requirement of God's word or forfeiting their liberty. A day will come where either you have to stand in lifting God's word or you have to give it up. There's no, now we are almost in between. We can be on sometimes this side, sometimes the other side. But a day will come where you have to choose you want you choose you want to this or you want the other one. It is time that we prepare ourselves to face that day. What shall we do now? Let me close with this. I would suggest three things. Before this knocks in your own life, knocks in your own church, knocks in your own country, in your own conference, in your own community, you need to be preparing so that when it comes, you have the strength to stand firm and uplift this torch of light that God has given us and the freedom that God has given us. I would suggest three things and I'll close. Number one, you must get to know your religious rights at your workplace, at your government level, and at your church level. Some of us do not know what our rights are. Please find out in the workplace that you go for work, find out, ask, what are my rights here? How much of my religion do I have the freedom to express what I want to be? In your own government, find out how, how they deal with these things. And in your own local church, have seminars, have educational seminars to find out what these religious liberties rights you have as a local member, as a local church. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, what are your limits? What are your opportunities? We must all be educated. Because if you don't know and something happens, you may fall into temptation. When you know the truth, we must be able to say it is written. You can only say it is written when it is in your mind and in your heart. So the first point is what? Get to know your human, uh, your religious liberty rights at your workplace, at your government level, at your local church. Stand up for your rights. Do not live in ignorance. Stand up. You may lose sometimes certain things, but don't worry. The Lord is on your side. The second one, get to know your beliefs so that you will not be deceived. Matthew 7, you know what it says? Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven, but those who do the will of the Father. And the same book says in the same chapter, if possible, the devil will deceive the very elect, if possible. You may think that you're elected by God, but if you're not careful, if you're not alert, the devil can even deceive you. So you must know your beliefs. There was once time when Adventists are known to be the people of the book. But nowadays, we hardly read Bible. Someone said, Adventists treat God's word like a chewing gum. What we do? We put in our, we, we read for Sabbath school, for Sabbath, and chew, chew, and spit out. What do you do with the chewing gum? You don't take it into heart. You, you chew. In other words, sometimes you only keep it in the head. It doesn't go into our heart. No point of keeping God's word in your head if it doesn't pour into your heart in practice and in love. So get to know, you know what Ellen White says in Great Controversy? Page 625, only, listen to this, this is important, only those who have been diligent students, some of us, we feed on sermons. Oh, I've heard this sermon, wonderful. I have got my food today. No, you must sit with your word daily and read and let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. You may be inspired by a sermon, but that's not your food. Your food is directly, you should take it from God's word. The preachers and other things, we are just here to encourage you, uplift you, and guide you to the real source. So, you know what Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 625, only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth, not only should be a diligent student of God's word, but you must receive the love of the truth that is in God's word. Only those people will be shielded from the powerful delusions that takes the world captive. As I said, we are going to experience severe times that are going to come. COVID-19 is nothing. Severe things are going to come. COVID-19 has changed our life to so many ways. But severe tragedy, severe punishments is going to come. Trouble, time of trouble, which maybe I will speak the, on Tuesday. Those who are students who are diligent students of God's word and those who love God's word and his truth will have the opportunity to be shielded from these delusions that takes the world as a captive. If you just read Bible on a surface level, get up in the morning, read some psalm, pray, and rush to work, and whole day you are not fed on God's word, you will starve. What does Amos say? There's going to come a famine in the last days. Not famine for food, 
examine for word of God. You may have 10 Bibles in your house. You may have Bibles, everything on your phone or in your iPad or apps, but you're still starving because you're not feeding on it. Make sure you feed on God's word daily and let it transform you. And the last one, third one, live an uncompromised life. Live an uncompromised life. One of the Scottish preachers 200 years ago, this is what he said. I looked for the church and I found it in the world. And I looked for the world and I found it in the church. A worldly church can never win the world for Christ. Let me repeat it again. I looked for the church and I found it in the world. And I looked for the world and I found it in the church. A worldly church can never win the world for Christ. Some of us live very compromised lives because we don't want to take this. I want us to be serious Christians. What you believe, uplift. Live by it. Take risks. Fortune favors the brave. Let's not be timid. We have Jesus on our side. You may lose your life, but it is better to lose a physical life, physical body, than losing your soul, your eternal values. A time will come where it will be tested severely, which we will talk about time of trouble. So live an uncompromised life. You know what Paul's advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 is? Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Clean lives. You must be an example. That's what we are called to do. Look at the scandals in the churches. The amount of problems we have, the amount of grumbling, gossiping, sins that we cover up and act as though we are holy. Go stand up and preach and teach and sing and then go sleep with somebody else and do something else and nobody knows about it. I'm deceiving myself if that's what my lifestyle is. Doing. Uncompromised life. Ellen White says, there is no limit to the usefulness of one who consecrates himself or herself completely to, to God, how God can use them. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching with a burden to myself and to burden to you. It is time that we lift up the banner in not what we speak out of our lips, but how we live. Paul's admonition to the Timothy is what? Be an example. Example means you don't say anything. People see and say, wow, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. Look at her humility. Look at the way she dresses. Look at the pleasantness. Look at the humbleness. Look at the purity. That's what we have to be. And Ellen White in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 717, this is what she says. Unless you rise to a higher, holier state in your religious life, you will not be ready for the appearing of our Lord. Let me repeat it. Unless you rise to a higher, holier state in your religious life, you will not be ready for the appearing of our Lord. So let me repeat this three. Get to know your rights and live by them. Get to know your beliefs, your God, word, God of word, and live by it. And live an uncompromised life. So that when Christ comes, we all can be found faithful. And go to heaven to live with him for eternity. 60, 70, 80, 90 years on this earth is like a bubble. It's like a moment. Comparing to what God has prepared us for eternity. So let's not live only for this moment. But let's live this moment to, for the eternity that is coming. God bless you all. Amen. I'd like to thank the pastor for the sharing that has come to us tonight. I'd also like to thank everyone who was able to join us. And I pray that we may continue to join into the meeting as we continue with this then. I pray that we continue to share and post these things on our social media accounts as well. Share the Facebook page as well, so that more people can be aware of the meetings that we've been having. I pray that you may be blessed and that you have a, a good week. Thank you and good night. Of the masters.
disappearing Yet signs all foretell That that moment is nearing That he shall return Is a promise most cheering But we know There's light for those who are seeking salvation. There's truth in the book, in the book of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to a great consummation. But we know. You ready? Jesus will come. He will come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his father's bright glory. But we know. the morning or in the evening but I know he will come he will come hallelujah hallelujah he will come, come in the clouds of his father's bright glory but we know not the hour we'll will pray with our lamps streamed and burning we'll work and we'll wait till the master's returning I will sing and rejoice every omen descending but we know Watching, you ready? Jesus will come. He will come. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. He will, he will come, come in the clouds of His Father's bright glory. But we know. Get ready, cause Jesus is ready. I know He will come. He will come. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of His Father's bright glory. But we know. This 